Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop, and this episode of the podcast is running right in line with our last two episodes, all on anti doping solutions and issues in the sport of trail and ultra running. For those of you that missed the last two episodes, go and check them out even before or after this podcast. It really doesn't matter. They are both good ones and they both set the table for the podcasts that are to come. Those are with Dr. Matt Fedorik, who is the chief science officer over at USADA, and with Paul Dimio, who is the author of the book, Anti-Doping Crisis in Sport, Causes, Consequences, and Solutions. And we really started to use those two conversations to kind of set the landscape of what anti-doping looks like across all different types of sports. This podcast is with a really interesting individual who was a former professional triathlete. She had a doping sanction imposed on her during her professional triathlon days and then came into the sport of ultra running. She qualified for the Western States Endurance Run and really got entangled within Western States' anti-doping policy. Her name is Lisa Roberts. Some of you will be familiar with her story, but if you are not, I encourage you to listen to this because it is an interesting nuance and an interesting wrinkle in this whole world of anti-doping and anti-doping solutions. Now, Western States came out with a very strong anti-doping policy a couple of years ago. I'm gonna leave a link to that in the show notes. We actually read that policy uh, throughout the course of this conversation. I encourage everybody to go check that out. That just is a simple point of education. I tried my best to stay neutral throughout this podcast. I have very, very strong feelings about this particular rule, but I didn't want to get involved too much in Lisa's story because I think it's a good one. It's a one that it's one that we can all learn from. And I would also like the listeners and everybody to appreciate the fact that Lisa raised her hand and she wanted to participate in this process. It would have been very easy for her to stick her head in the sand and not talk to anybody and just, you know, shut her ears down and not be part of this dialogue. Because being part of the dialogue when you've got a doping infraction that's on your record for forever, it's hard to come out and talk about it. And as we will come to find out, she has had to deal with some of the other negative consequences of this that a lot of people don't even really think about. So I encourage everybody to listen to the entirety of this conversation as well as some commentary that I will provide at the end during the outro of this. I did not want to entangle my personal thoughts and sentiment and, and sentiments too much within Lisa's story because Lisa's story should really stand on its own accord in terms of what we can learn from it. As a final point, I did let the fine folks over at the Western States Endurance Run know that I was producing this podcast just to give them a heads up because I'm a professional and that's the way I roll. And I, uh, I left it open to them. They can participate in this conversation in any way, shape or form that they wanted to. They can come on my podcast. They could have come on this podcast. They could do whatever. I left it on their shoulders to determine how they wanted to respond. They provided me with a statement that I read during the podcast and they insisted that I read it on the podcast, so I did. What I will say is that invitation is evergreen. So any of the fine folks over at Western States, you have an open forum on my podcast to talk about anything in perpetuity. That is an open invitation. You can always take advantage of it. Y'all know how to get a hold of me. That's it for the intro. That's it for the caveats. There's a lot of them the last few weeks. I'm sorry, you guys. Let's get right into the conversation with Lisa Roberts. So I, I want to know right out, right from the get-go, are you still racing with the baby Yoda on your pack or growing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> He's with me now, I think, for the for the long haul. So um, yeah, I mean, it started, I never, it started off as, you know, a legit kind of thing that I wanted to do. Um, when I first started doing any form of trail running, I was getting ready to do a, um, coast to coast multi-sport race in New Zealand, actually as a relay with my husband last year. And, um, we got down to New Zealand early to do some training on the course. And, you know, as New Zealand is very wild and very sort of 
almost just kind of uh, you know native looking. And so I'm running through all these mossy forests and trees and roots. And my, the first thing that clicked into my head was the Star Wars scene when Luke Skywalker is doing his Jedi training with Yoda and he's running with Yoda on his back. And I just thought, wouldn't that be funny if I, if I found a Yoda to put on my back so I could kind of run around like Luke Skywalker. And uh, that's, that's really where it came from. But I mean, I am a big Star Wars fan. That's obvious. And um, I do very much have a, you know, kind of a, I'm sort of a Zen type of runner. So I'm very much sort of feely runner. I go by feel. I don't look at really pace very much. And so, and that's, I, I do a lot of sort of drawing from what's around me, whether it be nature or other people or anything. So it is very much the force that I run with. So I figured why not? <laughs> and, yeah. It's like your stick now though, because you've been it is. several places and I mean, this is going to, this is going to sound horrible, but it's like, oh, there's, there's the girl with the baby Yoda on her back. <laughs> there's so many races now. I just did, um, well, attempted to do uh, the race in Whiskey Basin. And yeah, as I'm running along, I come by people and they said, you were at a recent race. I saw you there with baby Yoda, which one? And so we kind of go through, you know, I said, well, was it this one? And he saw me at Black Canyon with the baby Yoda. Um, people will come up to me, you know, just in general at either registration or at the start line and say, hey, oh, baby Yoda's here. And so it's actually a <laughs> wonderful way to make friends. And I love it. I asked, And there was one guy, because I actually, I had to end up um, bailing on, unfortunately on the whiskey basin. And so I'm walking back through the Dells to get back to the start line. And there was a guy who kind of came running past me and he was pretty well blown, but he was going to make it through the finish line. And all he said, as he came by me was, man, that baby Yoda is the best thing I've seen all day. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I'm sure you give a lot of people who you're in front of because you wear it on the back of your pack, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You give them, a, they, they probably look at it initially because it's a small, I saw it at Black Canyon. It's a small baby Yoda. It's you know, yeah. like four, four inches or something like that. Well, but... the whole thing is about like, yeah, like six or seven inches, but oh, I yeah. shove part of it into the pack um, to hold it in place. But yeah, yeah his little head sticks out. That's, so. Okay. So that's what, it, that's what kind of makes it odd visually because you look at it and you're like what is that weird thing on the back of that woman and then you get a little bit closer and you're like oh it's yoda that's kind of cool. yeah <laughs> uh, well cool well I'm, I'm glad that i hope that sticks around for longer because yeah he's gonna stay around. i have i have, have some backups in case you know that one kind of gets a little janky from being dirty and sweaty over time i may have to retire one and then enter in a new one but i'll hold on to this one as long <laughs> okay, as i can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might want to corner the market. They might become collector's items after a while. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so that's part of your ultra running stick now, or your ultra running career. Yeah. But, but um, I want to kind of go back to your triathlon career, and, and let me let me kind of set this up a little bit. So we're we're going to talk about um, an incident that you had during your triathlon career, and how it's played an impact to you on uh, in ultra running, and specifically with you being denied entry into the Western States 100. And I don't want to skip any steps here. I think that the whole the whole arc of the story is important to go through because it provides context. And so why don't you take take everybody back to like your triathlon days and let's just set the stage with like who you were as a professional triathlete and how long that 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 how long that career lasted and what types of events you were doing and things like that. Yeah, sure. So I all told um, competing in triathlon itself uh, since 2002. So um, close to about 18 years or so of triathlon. 2008, um, I got my professional license um, to race in the professional category um, through a qualification um, system that they have set up. Um, all the time I have um, been was working and even at the same time I turned professional uh, working as a landscape architect. So um, I was a working professional and that was sort of um, what people knew about me for the most part. And then um, not only working for another company, but then also having a shift to where I started my own business while I was racing professionally as a triathlete, which that was a difficult um, <laughs> period of time. But uh, so yeah, so in 2008, I not only turned professional as a triathlete, but also started my own small landscape architecture company and was trying to do both at the same time um, and manage that I'll say as well as possible, um, there's really no easy way to manage being a professional triathlete and, you know, running a business, but I did the best I could with what I had until I merged my company um, with another one in 2014. 
managed to get a little bit more freedom to, you know, to do some training and, and some rest that way. And then actually in 2016 is whenever I stepped back from my company and act to actually give professional triathlon a legit shot. Um, so yeah, I would say I, I was legitimately a professional triathlete since, you know, 2016, but technically since 2008. Um, so I was always known as being, you know, one that was working and um, doing triathlon at the same time. Yeah, which was not which is not uncommon in that world at yep. all. Still, even today, yep. Um, yep. I think it's important. I think an important distinction kind of needs to be made here because once again, this is going to be primarily an ultra running audience, and they kind of don't mm -hmm. know the world of triathlon. And in, mm -hmm. in an ultra marathon context, you can anybody, even me can yep. set a stake in the ground and say, oh, I'm a professional trail runner because there is no standard, but that's not true yes. in the sport of triathlon. So can you kind of briefly go over that just so everybody understands what it means to be a professional triathlete in the eyes of USA triathlon? Yeah, so you have to go through a qualification system and place, there's a few ways that you can do it. You can either place first or second in um, some sort of national um, championship race. So you can go and do it that way. And I think that's basically still kind of like the one way, you know, deal in. So if you peg a race, you can then take your pro card. Um, you can also do it by placing, I think you're in a two or three races within, I think at the time um, that I did within a, a year or 18 month period, where if you're racing in a race that has, has to have at least $5,000 in prize money to it, and you have to place within 10% of the top finishers time. So at least it's just kind of proving that you have, you know, kind of what it takes to, to race as a professional. So that's another way that you can go about doing it. And then every two years, you have to kind of re up that and still prove that you've, you know, been able, same thing, like you've placed in a certain percentage of time from the top finisher, at least at one race, I think. And then, then you can take your pro card again. So you have to kind of keep proving that you're still able to do this um, reasonably. I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you already brought up the notion of a pro card because yeah. not a lot of people realize it is actually a card, like a physical card yeah, that you carry around in your wallet, you know, yep. you like, what, does it get you any discounts at any like stores or anything? Like there that? are some, yeah, they give you some discounts and you have to, you know, obviously take it to you whenever you go to registration right. along with, you know, a photo ID to ma match the two. Yeah. So um, that's how you um, become a professional. And that, that was one of the things that was very interesting to me when um, even getting into ultra running was, you know, how do I, do I call myself an elite runner? Can I just right. do that? <laughs> right. Right. Uh, yeah. But that, that's the, that's part of the story that I wanted to paint here is you went through a process. It's a performance-based process. that's set up mm -hmm. by USA triathlon to where you can kind of go up the ranks and eventually you earn the right mm -hmm. to be called a professional and, or be a card carrying professional <laughs> yeah. of, of, USA tra of, of USA triathlon. And so when that happens from, a, from a, uh, competition standpoint, what's different? What's different between a non-pro and a pro? Yeah. From the competition standpoint, I mean, you got the basics of registration. You might be able to um, register for a race up to maybe about six weeks before the race, where sometimes it would be already maybe sold out, you know, for an age group um, racer. Yep. That's kind of a nice thing. It gives a little bit more flexibility for the professionals to be able to change plans if they have to, for whatever reason. Um, I mean, you get sort of, you know, a, you start in front of everybody else, um, which I could tell a really good story about why that wasn't that great at a race I did in Brazil, but <laughs> um, you get to start first um, before age group athletes go because it then provides a, a clean race, um, right. a more clean race for the professionals. And you get kind of, you know, better bike racking positions as well, a little bit of perks like that. I mean, as far as the, I mean, obviously the training kind of has to, you know, you have to up your game a bit more um, to compete in that professional category because you're competing against other professionals. And so there was quite a steep learning curve because um, most people kind of go from, you know, if they've been really very good age group athletes, so they're used to winning races all the time, or they're used to being way out in front, whatever it might be, to now all of a sudden, whoa, I am now kind of swarmed by other ladies or guys who are just as good as I am, if not better. And so it's, it's kind of a gut check um, as you kind of get sort of turned around a little bit on how you have to, you know, sort of look at yourself and where you're at and, and your place within the, the professional field. So there is a very steep learning curve with that. 
and and I guess the 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 picture that I'm trying to paint here is that it provides a structure for professionals to compete against other professionals. And in the yeah. sport of triathlon, where you're balancing three, where you're balancing three sports, and you got to compete for space on the yes. bike rack, and people are swimming and mm -hmm. cycling all over each other on closed courses and things like that. That's a necessary component to have a professionalism cat or a professional category or professionalism defined. Yes, within, within that particular within that particular sport and triathletes kind of like almost I don't know if they take it for granted, but they don't realize that that kind of formalized structure may not exist out kind of outside of their sport. Mm -hmm. So to 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 play off of that a little bit, can can you take everybody through some of like the highlights or try to like tr uh, try to explain like how how good were you as a legit in your words <laughs> professional triathlete like what kinds of races were you do how are you placing the races and stuff like that yeah i mean it still took quite a while um to once i turned professional to where i kind of started landing on some podiums at least I was coming top three um there was a good couple years there where you know you kind of struggle along maybe you know placing in the top 10 and kind of get your feet wet and get you know more experience in what it's like racing in, with the other pros um, but I would, I always tended to do the more technically difficult races. So I like, I was a very bad swimmer, um, <laughs> in terms of racing against other professionals, not the greatest swimmer. And I struggled with that still do to this day of trying to get my swim up to where it needs to be. And it never quite got to that point, um, of where it really needed to be. So I was always giving up a lot of time in the swim to get onto the bike and then the run. I was always a much better runner than anything else. So I would just choose my courses wisely, I guess. Um, so choose the hillier bike courses, um, run course. Yeah. If it's hilly or if it gets really hot on the run, even better because I live in Arizona. So I got very good at choosing the right courses that suited me and my strengths better. So if it was a wetsuit legal swim, meaning the water was cold enough to allow that, um, to legally race in a wetsuit, I'm there. <laughs> so those are the races I chose. So there's some pretty iconic races that I did in Europe um, over the years, um, several of them in France and in Switzerland and Germany, again, because they have some pretty legit, um, hard, hilly, mountainous bike courses and runs. Um, and then I started my first podium that I landed on was a race in um, Ironman Los Cabos. And that was in 2000. And I think it was 14 or 15. And uh, that was the first podium I landed on after many, many years of work um, to get there. And I just kind of thought I've finally, I've kind of cracked this. And from there it was, you know, multiple podiums um, and actually did not even peg my first win in a long distance race until 2017. So many second places, a lot of third places, never quite able to crack that to that top step. Um, and then finally hit it in 2017. Um, which ironically enough was about the 10 year mark of me, you know, training for triathlon specifically, which I've always heard that it's about yeah. 10 years or 10,000 hours of training before you can really master it. And, um, <laughs> I thought, well, that's odd because that's about what it took, um, to get there. So yeah. And then from 2017, um, until I've kind of finished in 2020, managed to, uh, rack up six wins um, on the Ironman circuit. So I was more, more of a long distance, um, triathlete. So there's a lot of variation in the distances. You've got sprint triathlons, which might take people around maybe an hour to complete mm -hmm. up to what I did was the Ironman or the iron distance races, which you're looking at a nine hour event, um, plus depending on the course. So that's where I was, where my bread and butter was mainly because I had a long enough run, um, as part of the race to make up for my really <laughs> poor swim. So <laughs> I love the honesty. Yeah, um, okay. this is this is perfect. And I want the I want the listeners to understand you're 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 being very humble in this. You were a very good triathlete. You weren't oh, well, thank a, you. a legit. Yeah, you weren't just a legit professional or a professional <laughs> like you were a good triathlete. Any tri any triathlete who's getting to the podium or winning in any of the Ironman races, they're good. They're great Thank athletes. You. They're at the top of their field. They're within the top 1% of, you know, everybody competing. And I, I don't think, I think that that's really important in the context of this, of, of this whole story, that it's not just you're, you know, with all due respect, you're just <laughs> some triathlon schmuck, you know, coming <laughs> over to ultra running and trying to, you know, like take over the world or whatever, like right. you're a 
a good, legitimate, experienced, also to your tenure point, mm -hmm. athlete that decided to, 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 to take a crack at trail running. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So now that we've got the, now that we've got the career kind of painted sufficiently enough for everybody to understand where you're coming from, let's mm -hmm. kind of get to the meat and potatoes of it. So yep. we're going to talk, talk about uh, a doping sanction that you had stemming from yep. a race. Mm -hmm. And before the before we get into this, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you coming on a tremendous amount. Thank I've you, you know I, I've been involved in elite athlete elite athletics for I don't know, almost twenty years now, and this is a when athletes have sanctions, it is a really difficult thing to help them work through, and they have sanctions at all different levels and all different sports and all different circumstances, and it's it's difficult for athletes to like come come up front and like actually kind of expose themselves and talk about the whole thing because they want mm -hmm. irrespective of how wrong they were and we'll, we'll talk about some of that yep. in a little bit they just want to they just want it to go away you yeah know? and yep. some athletes have legitimately made mistakes and said hey listen i made a mistake i did this this is wrong some of them ended up coming afoul of the rules for, through no, you know, ill intent of their own and a whole host of things in between. But irrespective of any of those situations, I've always appreciated the athletes that kind of raise their hand and say, listen, I want everybody to learn from this. I'm going to go out and use a platform and do it because that's hard. That's difficult. So I appreciate you coming on. I'd realize it's not the <laughs> most, um, I realize it's not the most, uh, 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 funny topics, not as fun as Star Wars to talk about, right? <laughs> but, uh, but it's a good one. I think the, the the audience will definitely learn a lot from it. And just to let the listeners know, you know, I've let I've let Lisa know that I'm going to give her a fair platform, and mm -hmm. the the listeners of this podcast will, will realize that I call a spade a spade. And mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to say, hey, listen, you need to think about this like this. I don't give people free passes or anything like that. And I'm going to treat you the same way. And you agreed, to, and you agreed to that that dialogue. Yep. And, and once again, that's part of the reason I appreciate it. So let's go to Roth, Germany, because mm -hmm. this is the kind of the epicenter. Of, this is the epicenter of this, of yes. this whole <laughs> sanctioning thing. Yes. Before we get there, though. Where was this in your career? Let's kind of timestamp this a little bit. You mentioned you've been a triathlete since, you know, the kind of early to mid 2000s, mm -hmm. took you 10 years to get a win. Where was this particular yes. race in that whole career arc? Yeah, this was kind of, well, sort of toward the end. So we were in 2017 for that race. Um, I was, I had, like I said, gotten on my first podium in 2014 or 15. So I was really kind of picking up steam and kind of getting the hang of what I was doing here and really hitting my stride on, on, um, how I was racing and what I was doing. So, um, you know, kind of toward a little bit toward the end, but I mean, timeline wise as well, my age, um, I think also played into it that I was sort of, uh, that mid to late thirties age group, which for women, um, in endurance sports, especially even in triathlon, that's a pretty, um, sweet spot right there yeah. for, for a lot of reasons. Women are you know pretty dang strong in these endurance events and as well as sort of the whole sort of build up to it as well. So it takes a lot of that training to finally get to that point as well. So a lot of things were converging that point. Yes. But you'd been good by then, right? I mean, you'd mm -hmm. seen podiums, you'd seen success. Yep. You weren't, you didn't like all of a sudden lift off like a rocket ship into the atmosphere and find yourself at the top of the sport. I mean, you, I you wish. had to kind of, yeah, well, everybody wishes that, <laughs> that never happens in endurance sports. Yep. You kind of grind your way along and yep. as you, this might've been, you know, if we we're draw, drawing kind of the arc of your career, maybe just over the very mm -hmm. top of it and kind of toward, like towards, I always hate to say twilight, but you definitely weren't yeah. there right? I mean, it's past the apex. It's, it's yeah, exactly. To the point where, cause I had several other women friends of mine who were competitors who were also kind of similar athletes to me, like bad swimmers, you know, pretty decent cyclists and could run really well. And a few of them had, they had just recently retired. Maybe if, if it wasn't that year, maybe the year before. So there were a few of us who were already kind of like, okay, I've had my shot. Hurt. I probably need to, <laughs> I probably need to kind of reassess what I need yeah. to do. But I kind of, I, I stuck in there for whatever reason, I stuck in there and started pegging a few races. And, and I remember kind of even responding back to them going like, oh man, you guys, you just stick with it a little bit longer. Maybe you could have. So, so I'm like, I'm doing this for you now. And so, so yeah, so it was, I would say that's a, that's a, a totally accurate way to, to paint it is sort of, I'd hit the peak a bit, maybe starting to come down a little bit. Yeah. 
I wouldn't have said yeah. that to you at the time. Yeah, <laughs> nah, yeah, no. <laughs> a little bit of hindsight. I don't feel bad. So, okay, so I know there's a little bit of backstory before Raw. So you can mm -hmm. go as far back as you want to, Lisa. This is your story. Okay. I'm turn the floor over to you. Go. Okay. Yeah, so well, we'll build up in, in, into Roth. It wasn't too far behind um, when I went to go race in Roth. It was actually earlier that year um, where I had, well, actually even just a little bit before that I'll go, um, late the previous year, um, I actually suffered the one and only major injury that I had racing as a triathlete. And I got a stress fracture in uh, my fourth metatarsal. And so I had a broken foot, um, sort of October, November timeframe and, um, was dealing with that and healing that up. And at the same time, I had also switched to a, to a new coach as well, arguably probably the most, the hardest coach out there. Um, <laughs> um, Brett Sutton and I actually teaming up along with Mary Beth Ellis, who, um, was retired professional triathlete and, um, called the honey badger. So because honey badger give no shits and those, those are my coaches now. So, and even that, that, um, sort of step that I took was, uh, it took me a long time to make that step because I know what I was getting into and I, but I was ready to make that, take that step to really dig into some really hard training and give this last few years, everything I had. So I was willing to just do whatever they told me to do in training to make myself as best as I possibly could before I thought basically I'm too old to kind of continue on doing this. So that was kind of the, the, the mindset that I was in and what I was dealing with, with the broken foot, which I'd never deal, dealt with anything like that before. Um, which was really disappointing for me because I was feeling probably in the best shape that I ever had um, going into that stress fracture. Um, I had qualified, I ended up qualifying twice for the World Ironman World Championships in Kona as both times as a professional um, and went into that race in 2016, October of 2016, in what I would say it was the best shape of my life um, by far and uh, got sick a few days before the race. So I had a pretty subpar race. Um, which really kind of set me back a bit, but I kind of resurgent again um, with this new coach and now with a broken foot. But um, so with that new coach, he's based in, in Europe. So as I kind of turned into the beginning part of 2017, planning a summer long uh, trip to train with him and the rest of the team um, in Switzerland and had lined up um, a number of races to do while I was in Europe. Um, training with them. And one of them being the uh, challenge uh, Roth race in Germany in July. And, what, and so what type, of, what type of triathlon is that since people aren't going to be, be? Oh, that one was also a long distance triathlon. So it was the 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then the marathon to finish it off for the day. So, and it's, it's an absolutely epic race. I would say even on the level of like Kona like yeah. sort of popularity and eyeballs on that race, it's a big race. Big race. Um, and actually wasn't even really one that I had, I mean, it was sort of on the list to do just because it was such an epic race to, to actually, to kind of a bucket list race to do, but with the broken foot, I wasn't quite sure exactly what I was going to get to do that summer. So we had some eh, tentative plans. So, um, in the prep to head to Europe for, for three months, um, to train and race, um, you know, getting everything lined up and ready to go, um, in Tucson before I need to leave. One of which was to check back in with uh, my asthma doctor because I was diagnosed with asthma actually back in 2013 um, after a very bad experience that I had. Um, well, it was there was a lot leading up to that that I just sort of shook off as maybe um, allergies that I was having as far as the symptoms were. But I was complaining to my coach at the time that I was having troubles breathing and and um, you know kind of having mild panic attacks with um, some of the harder training that I was doing. And it kind of culminated, I sort of brushed it off, brushed it off. And it culminated with um, a major panic attack to the point where I thought I was going to drown in a swim that I did in, in St. George, Utah, as part of a half iron distance race, where I started off swimming, water was kind of cold, had a major attack, um, had to stop and hold on to like one of the pontoons or the buoys and regroup and then just kind of, you know, muddle my way through the rest of the swim. So that was the catalyst for me to then go maybe get checked to see something's not right here. Um, and then was diagnosed at that point with um, asthma, not only just exercise induced asthma, but just, I guess what you'd call it sort of everyday asthma. I don't know. It was a, it was an everyday thing. So um, that was pretty surprising to me. And at that point started on, um, a, I had a rescue inhaler 
for to stave off any, particularly in cold situations, cold water, cold air situations, um, to do that if I was um, getting into an attack. And um, also had um, an everyday inhaler um, that I would have to do uh, use twice a day. And so I was going along with that for a couple of years. And, you know, that seemed to, to kind of help a little bit with the, you know, attacks and, and keeping things a little bit more moderated um, for myself. Um, and then, so then before I was getting ready to head over to Europe that summer, I checked it back in with my asthma doc because I was still not quite, didn't feel like it was totally meeting my needs. And I had a lot of, you know, this is probably going to be gross, maybe too much detail, but like a lot of phlegm issues that I was having. Um, got an with, ultra in a crowd. Phlegm is like, okay, of, this is true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast, so. Okay. Good. <laughs> Cause there was a really gross phlegm stuff that was going on. I thought this can't be right. And I thought it was maybe from the inhalers that I was using. Cause it was the sort of the everyday one um, that I was using was um, like the, a powder inhaler. So it was a twist inhaler and I had like a little powder. I just thought, what about this? Like inhaling some sort of fine micro powder into your lungs for asthmatics makes sense. I just never really quite got that. And so I thought, you know, before I go to Europe for the summer and, and do this training, so I want to check in, see if there's maybe some different options that might help with this phlegm issue. And so um, that was uh, my meeting with my um, asthma doc. And to where we then made a switch to a different um, inhaler, twist inhaler was a, you know, another one of the, the powder ones, unfortunately. Um, but um, so we switched to this different inhaler that was called Brio. And it was a fairly new inhaler um, on the market at the time. And it was um, a bit of a game changer one because it was one of the first ones that came out where you only had to do it, uh, uh, inhale it once a day, which for me as a long distance athlete that does multiple trainings in a day has races that are nine plus hours to not have to carry around another inhaler and remember to take it, you know, halfway through the day or halfway through the event to stave things off was, was huge. Um, so we decided to switch to that particular, um, inhaler, um, being that it was, um, my perception kind of part of the, um, you know, same family of inhalers, um, just a different brand of inhaler. Um, and, Moved on um, from that point, you know, got the prescription, um, was more focused, I think, on getting the prescription and making sure I had it enough for while I was gone for three months because I can't refill a prescription while I'm in Europe and kind of went on on my way. Um, I'll also add to this um, part of the story is that um, I, at that point in time, had also been part of um, USADA's uh, or Ironman's registered testing pool. Um, which, which basically puts on, puts on to me as an athlete to provide 24 seven whereabouts, um, to USADA. So they have an app for that where I have to tell them where I'm going to be every day. Um, and then also in addition, give them a one hour window where they know that they can find me at home, um, to test, um, at any point in time. Were you so, ever subject to that, to the random testing? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, and I'm, I can't remember the actual year that I got on um, to that testing pool. I think it was 2014, but don't hold me to that. Okay. Um, but yeah. So, but, but at some point, uh, it, this is important. So at some point you're in the testing pool, right? Yes. And you're in the whereabouts program concurrently yes. with your previous asthma medication. Yes. Yeah. And um, what with that, because um, so it was definitely around about that same time I was diagnosed with asthma because I distinctly remember that when I was diagnosed I um, got from my doctor all the um, documentation for that to apply for a therapeutic use exemption, which people just call a TUE. Um, and I sent that into USADA um, just because I thought, well, asthma, you know, inhaler, I just thought, send it over. And so I sent it over all that, you know, the spirometry tests, everything that came from my doctor that basically said, you know, I am asthmatic and this is, you know, what I need to take for it. And um, got back from USADA that um, what I was using and that particular dosage didn't require a TUE. And so, but I kept doing that every year um, for several years, just checking to make sure. Um, I know, because I know they update the rules every year that we have, we're required to, uh, you know, read those rules. Because, you know, medications and, and, and um, you know, uh, substances and even methods um, you know, kind of change over the years. So, uh, what may be, you know, regarded as prohibited one year might not be the next year, um, and, and vice versa. So, um, so yeah, so as part of that registered testing pool, we go through kind of an education um, portion, 
um, as to you know what's you know allowed and not allowed. Um, and we have to provide these whereabouts um, to USADA. So yes, I was um, subject to random testing um, any point in time um, and um, had that happen on multiple occasions while I was at home or, or otherwise. Okay, uh, so you, you had a previous prescription for inhaler of which you declared a TUE for USADA and they said, you don't need it. Yep. You decided to change through yep. the advice of your doctors, through your physician, through a process. Hey, this one's going to be better than this one. People change medications for things kind of all the time. Yep. The new one is Brio. Yep. That's, that's important for everybody to remember. Yes. So now take us to the, the relocation and then racing and raw. Yeah. Yeah. So I got the Brio inhaler, um, and then, you know, went on to, to Europe to do my racing and then, um, jumped into the challenge Roth race. And uh, up to that point, hadn't had any out of competition tests, um, despite the fact of, you know, providing whereabouts and, and making myself available to that. Um, so my first test after that switch was um, after I finished the race at Challenge Roth, in which I got third place. Um, so they have, obviously, for top three, they have testing. And then I think it's usually like maybe a random, you know, chosen one um, who also finishes. So when you get tested in, in competition and actually even out of competition, there's a process that you go through whereby you, um, you declare everything that you have taken. I think it's within 24 hours. It might be 48 hours. They, I think it is, it's technically 24, but they tell you maybe just write down everything you've taken within the last 48, you know, right. just in case. So I go through and, and it, this on. is the reason yes. let me step in here really quick. The reason for that is that there are, there are substances that are prohibited in competition and substances that are prohibited yes. out of competition and yes. in competition has a specific window associated with it. And it can be different per sports and some sports it's like yes. up to six hours after the competition or something like that. Mm -hmm. but the reason that, that, that the time, like, cause everybody's going to, why, why do they, why don't they give you a specific timeline for it? The reason <laughs> they don't give you a specific timeline for it is because of this in competition and out out of competition uh, designation and that some every once in a while there are sub substances that cross the barrier from being legal out of competition to illegal or yes. illegal within a certain threshold within the competition. They're just trying to cover all their bases essentially to have a story yeah. to paint for if they have to go back and check something. So that that's correct. What yeah. Yeah. So you go through and you list, I mean, I, you just list everything. So I list every multivitamin that I've taken, right. yep. everything, you know, how many of them, I mean, usually it's just, they just say, you know, put, you know, if you took one multivitamin pill, you don't necessarily have to have at the top because you've literally just finished, you know, an Ironman distance right. race and you have to kind of pull all this stuff from your memory and make sure you get it all down. So everything that I've put down, um, every, any supplement that I've taken, um, I will put down everything that I've taken as far as the types of gels that I've eaten or, um, drink mixes or even anything that I took on course, um, because there have been history of right. things like that as well, um, being issues. So everything I could possibly think of, um, you write down this list, um, obviously including, um, the Brio inhaler. And if I did have to take my rescue inhaler for some reason, I would list that as well. And how many puffs that you would take of that. So you list out, you declare everything that you've taken and then you go in and it's what, you know, it might be a urine test. It might be a blood test. Um, it this does require somebody that has to, well, the media, the instant that you cross the finish line, you have your representative comes up to you and says, you know, well, you, you, you got to do your drug test. That person cannot let you out of their sight until you do the drug test. So they're following you around while you're talking to people or getting pictures taken or doing interviews or anything with their little clipboard um, until you go in, you write down all your stuff, and then you're kind of within the realm of the USADA testing person. Um, to the point where they then the person also comes into the bathroom with you um, if it is a urine test and they watch you pee in the cup um, so they have to come on in and and uh, there you go so you provide your sample and then you know you're, you're pretty much done um, with that and so i uh, did you know my testing um did the race you know you go on and it's usually by the time they get through all the testing and stuff um because usually it, it coordinates with whenever you get your paycheck uh, for the race because um, they have to go through all the testing before they actually cut checks to people um, for obvious reasons. So um, that is kind of my lead up into doing the race and my test at Roth. Um, I then got a call from USADA about, 
I would say, I think it was maybe about two months later or so. I'd already been back in, in the United States. So yeah, two, maybe two and a half months later, um, notifying me that there was an adverse finding um, from my, sam my urine sample um, at Challenge Roth. And so it, in that time frame, even from Challenge Roth until I got home, I had done, you know, a couple other races as well. So um, with, you know, I don't know if I was tested. I actually, I was tested at one of the other ones too, but never got any call back at, for an adverse finding, which is kind of interesting because I pretty much did the exact same thing that I always do. Yeah. So um, yeah. So they told me there was an adverse finding. I proceed to absolutely panic because I have no idea what it could possibly be. They at that point mentioned that um, it was for volanterol was a pro prohibited substance that showed up on my urine sample. And they said, it's pretty, we're pretty sure it's going to, it's from the Brio inhaler that you declared on your drug test whenever you got tested at Challenge Roth in Germany, to which I kind of panicked at that point and realized oh my God, I did not submit my medical documentation to USADA when we switched to this inhaler. And that was a royal mistake that I had made. Um, and so I panic thinking, okay, they said, um, at that point they said, look, just can you get us the medical documentation um, for you know, that switch to Brio and we'll get that in the system and you know, process it to get you a therapeutic use exemption to use it. And Brio, again, at that point in time, being a fairly new inhaler on the market, um, was one of those where you couldn't just sort of rock up and be that, that would be the first inhaler that USADA would let you use because it was, they needed to see kind of a history of being asthmatic and trying other inhalers um, before they would let, um, basically allow that. And so because I had that history, um, I think that's, I think that's why, you know, the TUE was approved a week after I got the initial call from USADA. So the very same day when they um, called to tell me the adverse finding, I submitted all the appropriate documentation that I should have um, submitted back before I even left to go to Europe to race. Okay. So let's pause a little yes. bit. I know this is kind of like peeling off old wounds here, so I'll give yes. you a little bit of a break. Let me encapsulate this for a second. So you're in your professional triathlete, triathlon career. You've been a part of uh, anti-doping control at various formats, race formats, whereabouts formats, random testing, and things like that. You're used to the run of show. You've declared TUEs before. There are yes. use exemptions before. You switch up coaches. You switch up uh, medications. You fly abroad to a race. You forget to declare a therapeutic use exemption for a new medication you're, you're taking and you get an adverse finding for a metabolite of that. I think that's mm -hmm. the correct way to, to, uh, to, to describe it. I think, uh, Dr. Federick, who we'll have on the podcast, uh, in a little bit, uh, might, uh, he, he might, uh, he, uh, he might correct my vocabulary on that, but it's a metabolite <laughs> of the inhaler, uh, uh, mm -hmm. that you took. You then went back to USADA and said, Hey, listen, I declared this as a mm -hmm. medication that I was taking at the end of the race when they were testing me. Yes. But I failed to declare it as a TUE beforehand. Is all that timeline correct? Yes, that is absolutely okay. correct. Yes. So at that point in time, once you go through the whole paperwork and the whole adjudication process with USADA, which we might have to gloss over parts of that because I know <laughs> yeah. how painstaking and detail. I mean, that's not like, I think that's, a, that's too much detail for this podcast. Yeah. What did USADA decide to do with you? Like you've got a really interesting use case, but not unique. Right. What, so right. what did they do? Yeah. So, um, we, they told me of that finding and then I asked them at that point, if I had the ability to get what's called a retroactive TUE, because once they were saying, you know, we will, we will definitely have to disqualify you from your race at Roth. Cause that's the, the competition where you tested and we found this prohibited substance. Um, so I knew that that was happening and I asked to get a retroactive TUE if that was possible, um, which I did try to do and they did not allow that, which is, is kind of an interesting thing because, and, and I get it, um, that the retroactive TUE process is not for some idiot who forgot to submit their TUE documentation. It's for like an emergency situation where if somebody had to get like an emergency IV for something or whatever that, you know, exceeds sort of the limit or whatever, it is, that's what that's for. Right. Although I did try to get a retroactive TUE and was not allowed to do that. So they, I, you know, 
continuing to talk through them. They have some athlete ombudsmen as part of USADA. Um, so they put me in touch with some of them to, to kind of talk some of this through, you know, a few of the options and, and, you know, what to expect from USADA as far as, you know, what sanction comes down from them. And so my whole thing throughout the whole process was just obviously be as compliant and as quick with whatever they asked me to give them, I gave them as soon as humanly possible. And so, um, it came down through a process of that over a couple of weeks where they decided that my particular sanction um, for this rule violation was to get a public warning. Um, so there was no, um, they decided to have no racing ban um, placed on me. So I didn't, was never not allowed to race. I was basically, um, I don't want to, yeah, it, it, a slap on the wrist, I guess some people would call it, um, depending you on admonished. your severity. I mean, you got yeah. admonished. They said, yeah. Lisa. I mean, I just, yeah. sorry, I didn't want to step on it. But when I read the, when I read it, which I'll put a link in the show notes to the actual rule violation, anybody can go look it up. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I'm like. Oh, she just got admonished. Yeah. 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 So they just make this publicly aware that this happened. Right. Um, and then because the test was taken and they found it at that competition, I was dis disqualified from that competition. Um, which I mean, for what it's worth cost, that cost me about 15 grand, um, that I lost there. And, um, again, throughout the whole process, because this is part of it as well, is that you're trying to think, oh, do I need, should I seek some legal, um, advice on this and get lawyers involved? And I mean, let's face it, triathlon is not, I'm not making a lot of money doing this, um, at all. I mean, it's very much, you do it for the, for the love of the sport really. And if I can just limit my losses while I'm doing this, as well as having some fun and learning about myself, you know, that, that's all, that's all good. So we literally just kind of came down, my husband and I, you know, decided it's probably not worth it money wise to really pursue this legally. I mean, I'm, I'm basically, I have admitted and said, yeah, I, this is what I took. Um, this is why. And so I didn't really have, you know, much to stand on there or to argue. So we just figured, okay, the public warning, you know, we'll take that and, you know, kind of move on from that just disqualified from that one race, you get the public warning, continue on your way, Lisa. And that was about what it came down to. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to pause here again. And just for clarifications for the listeners, the, the entirety of this press release, because people don't realize this as well. You saw yes. the issues, basically a press release. Yes. Anytime there's any adverse finding after all is said and done, after they've gone through everything, they, they release this and some of them get buried on the back page of the news and some of them end yes. up making big news depending upon how big the athlete is or how, yep. how high profile the case is. Yep. Um, so there's a, there's like a public record of this for, yes. for everybody for forever, mm -hmm. as long as you saw decides to put it up there. But I want to read two paragraphs in particular, if that's okay with, with you, Lisa. Sure. Yep. I think this really points to the to the, the sanctioning component of this whole ordeal, which is very important. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to skip the first couple paragraphs, which is just boilerplate legally. Yeah. Here, here's, here's, the, here, here's the crux of the, uh, of the sanctioning piece. After, and USADA says, after a thorough review of the case, including the examination of medical records provided by the athlete, which is you, Lisa, mm -hmm. USADA determined that Robert's positive test was caused by the prescribed inhaler that she declared and was using in a therapeutic dose under the care of a physician. Although the substance was taken at the direction of a physician, the World Anti-Doping Code requires athletes to obtain a therapeutic use exemption or TUE before using a prohibited su substance. Roberts has since obtained a TUE for the use of the inhaler. In addition to a public warning, Roberts has been disqualified from all competitive results obtained at the Roth, uh, challenge Roth, including forfeiture of any medals, points, or prizes. It makes it seems like there was like 10 events during Roth. There's one trial. <laughs> you no, know, it's one race. Yeah. One race. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that too, because it, it, it just, it reads plural, but it really Yeah, does. it does. Yeah. Okay. So that's the gist of the sanction. And I, I yes. think like colloquially, we will, you can use slap on the wrist, but basically they said, hey, listen, you, you were afoul of the rules. You were afoul of the rules from a technical error. You weren't trying to do this to cheat in USADA's mind. Right. So what, so after this, what happens next from you as a, for, from you as an athlete? Like you had this happen. Did you, what did your sponsor say? How did you like handle your racing career and stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, it was obviously for obvious reasons, a huge hit to me emotionally, mentally, you know, even physically to a certain point, because I consider myself a completely fair 
athlete and person in general. Um, and so, and given this the, kind of the state of just, you know, now anyway, anything that's public, um, you get onto social media kind of things, that to me is almost, might be even as worse as, or worse than, yeah. um, you know, other things that could possibly happen. So, you know, understanding the severity of that just from the social media and perception standpoint um, was really very difficult for me. Um, not that I necessarily feel like I want to have everybody like me, but it's just sort of, I didn't think that that portrayed me as who I really am. Uh, Cause I know some people read into these things and are very sort of black and white with them. And I thought, Oh, I'm going to get painted into some sort of picture or into some sort of corner by some people. Um, but basically kind of had to focus away from that and just realize, you know, I am who I am. So there was a long period of, of that. And also again, getting a little bit older in the sport going, you know what, do I want to deal with this? Should I just retire now and just be done? But I still just had this, you know, desire and love to continue to race. I thought, man, I still have, I still have some gas in the tank here and I want to try this out. So I was very conflicted there for a while and still had a few other races that I was doing that year too. So there was, there was that perception of, you know, what are people, how are people going to treat me at races? I was, I will say that one of the races that I did, I was, because I, despite trying not to read social media um, things about the, the thing I did anyway, um, which I shouldn't have done. So I knew there were a few other athletes out there that um, were kind of bad mouthing me in this whole process that were going to be at one of the races that I was getting ready to do. And I was so terrified that they were going to mess with my equipment somehow or do something to sabotage my race that the day before the race, when you had to rack your bikes and put all your stuff basically out to sit out all night, right. um, I sat outside the transition area where I racked my bike um, and just sat there on the curb until the transition area closed, make, just watching my bike to make sure nobody touched it um, <laughs> before the race. Um, so I was very paranoid. Um, and my sponsors that I had, um, my current sponsors that I had at that point in time, I had to, before even the public warning came out, I was given plenty of time to give all of my supporters and sponsors um, some, some notice of this, obviously. So they knew what was going on. They knew when it was coming out and to a certain extent knew what it was going to say, at least in general. So I was basically making everybody aware that, you know, was hugely important to this, um, aware of what was going to happen. So there was no surprises there. Um, they, all my current um, sponsors continued to support me. Um, you know, it, they continued to sponsor me even as well, because I'd been with most of them for many years. And so they, they knew they could see it for what it was and continued to support me, which was great. Um, on the other hand, I was, because I was, you know, doing a bit better um, and, you know, winning a few more races, I was in negotiations with some newer sponsors for the upcoming year. And I did lose all of those. Um, I basically kind of got the standard, you know, we can't with this out there. Right. And I get it. You know, you can't, you're sitting around a table figuring out which athletes you're going to pick up for the next year. And you got one of them that has this recent public warning. That's a hard sell <laughs> yeah. to support that person. So while it was disappointing, um, it was still, you know, very upsetting to me that I was kind of reaching this thing that I'd worked so hard for, for all these years and kind of seeing it crumble in front of me. Um, so it was a very difficult time. Okay. Yeah. So here, here, here's where the conversation is going to get a little bit tough and I'm going to play the role of all of the skeptical, really hard eye rolls that are going on in the audience yes. right now. Who's listening yes. to this. They're listening to this story and they're saying to themselves, I have heard this a thousand times. Mm -hmm. I've heard of athletes that get popped for something that run afoul of some sort of anti-doping control. They claim that they were taking some medication all along and then they get a slap on the wrist at the end of the day. And it looks like there's some sort of appearance of, you know, that they're, that they're, that they're, that they're doing something wrong. And very unfortunately, so if you look at the land, if you kind of look at the competitive landscape of everything, both the athletes that are cheating and the athletes that are not cheating and just run afoul of the rules, they use the exact same excuses. And I I, that's really tragic. I think that, that, yeah. that is really, really, really tragic, but they all use the, well, I've never tested positive excuse. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And so on and so forth. But, it, but, it, but in your case, once again, this is, this is something that produces a, like it produces a pause from people that are looking at it from the outside in because they've heard and they've seen these stories before of athletes that run afoul and they kind of weasel their way out of 
whatever sanction via any means necessary. And one of those loopholes, and it has criticism for good reason, is the TUE loophole. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, what is your, what kind of what's your reaction to that? Because you've lived through it, right? What's your yeah. reaction to kind of that collective sense that, ah, she's just telling us the same story that everybody else has told us? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a hard one because in, in some ways I can, I see that point of view. I mean, I can see where there's a black and white point of view um, of, you know, TUE, you know, regardless if it's allowed by USADA or WADA, you know, still shouldn't be allowed if you're going to kind of compete in a professional sense. And so I understand that view. Um, however, you know, given my personal experience with trying to solve an issue that I have um, medically, I was just trying to do the best that I could um, with what I had at that point in time. I would say if there's anything for my specific case, I guess, um, if there's anything that may sort of clear that out a bit is the fact that um, as of this year, or yes, as of this year, 2021, um, Brio, the, the asthma inhaler that I uh, was taking, I'm not even taking it anymore, actually, um, but um, is no longer on that list um, to have to get, that requires a TUE as long as you're taking it in a therapeutic dose. Um, so I don't know if that, you know, helps to clear it, um, for people in that, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's always going to be science is always kind of catching up. I think in a lot of these, um, situations, like I said, it was a new inhaler on the market, probably hadn't gone through or had a chance to go through whatever testing that USADA needs to do. I don't know how they come up with these determinations as to what's on the list or what's not that requires a TUE, but if that makes people feel any better that that. That exact same inhaler no longer requires a TUE. Um, I hope that does it. <laughs> well, you and I, we're not going to solve the TUE thing here. We're yeah. not domain experts on it. I'm going to bring on a domain expert, and probably two to talk about this in, in, in other podcasts. That's definitely one element of it. But there's, yeah. this, there's this other element of it. And I, as a coach of, of, of professional trail runners or elite trail runners, however mm -hmm. we're going to call them today, I'm very well aware of this because I've had to, you know, counsel my athletes on this. And this is your professional and you were a legitimate good professional and had been a legitimate good professional for a long time. You should know better. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. to me, putting my skeptical competition hat on again, I've got an athlete that's been through the system that should know better. That's applied for TUEs before. And for mm -hmm. whatever reason, she didn't do this one. That just doesn't sit right with yeah. that skepticism. So I, you can, yeah. you can, you can respond yeah. to that. And I think that's reasonable. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the only, I mean, I, I asked myself to this day, I still ask myself that question. Why? It's a very simple process. You can go to globaldro.com yeah. and type in anything that you want to take. Now supplements not included because they don't cover the whole supplement industry. That's oh, a whole no. other ball yeah, of wax. Yeah. Yeah. So any kind of, you know, prescribed drug or anything like that, you can type in to global DRO to see if it, requires a TUE, if it's prohibited in or out of competition, very simple. 30 seconds of me standing there in that doctor's office with him typing it in, none of, we're not having this conversation because yeah. I would have submitted my paperwork yeah. and none of this would have happened. I still would have had a TUE to use that particular inhaler. Uh, I probably still would have taken it because of its ability to only have to take it once a day, which was very important to me it eliminated, pretty much eliminated my use of having to take the rescue inhaler, which was also very important to me. Um, you thought it would have still had to approve it though. That's important. Yes. They still would have had to approve it. It's not like yes. they just like pencil whip it or whatever. They still got Correct. Like um, I don't know why I didn't decide that. The only thing that I can, the only thing that I can give you, I don't have a good excuse for it. I can, I can explain to you kind of the build up to it as to why I was so absent minded to it. And from that, I have learned to not take on so many things at once, not get so overwhelmed with trying to figure out, you know, what I need to have packed and what I need to have ready to go to go spend three months away from home to train for a very, you know, difficult sport that requires a lot of equipment and gear and setup and everything. And I just think that I was distracted and not thinking correctly at that point in time. I was trying to check a thing, a box off the list. Yes, 
got my asthma medication sorted out, got the prescription figured out so I could have three months of it while I was away. Done. Let's move on to the next thing. And that's, that's the only thing that I can come up with as to why it, it's such a simple thing that I could have done and I didn't do. And I just hope that people can relate to that on whatever level. Professional, I mean, if there's anybody out there who hasn't made a mistake at work that has made their boss upset, that has cost the company money or themselves money, then go ahead and, and they can throw that stone and that's totally fine. But I have a feeling that most of us have had things like that happen. And that was my one time that it happened. And unfortunately, it's um, haunted me ever since. Well, I, I appreciate the honesty. First off, yeah. I know that's not an easy question. There's a lot of yeah. people that are asking that. And when I read stories like this, which I do quite frequently, people send them to me and I come across them in various yeah. formats. That's one of the first things I think that this professional athlete, professional athletes for, should know better. And yep. especially coming from my perspective where you mentioned the global DRO, I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. And you are right. It is really easy. They've done a fantastic yep. job of designing that where it takes you fit, maybe not even 30 seconds, maybe 15 yep. seconds to type in, this is the sport. This is what I'm taking. Boom. Yep. You've got your results right there. It takes a little bit of interpretation around the medical, you know, jargon and things like that, but that's yeah. neither, neither here nor there. But the point is, is as a professional, mm -hmm. a card carrying professional, mm -hmm. it's not that big of a leap of effort to do that. Correct. And yeah. it's something, it's definitely something as you've admitted as you should have, as you should have done. But I can also appreciate the fact that you're relating it to your work and everybody's had a bad day at work. And yeah. I've, you know, worked with professional athletes that have a bad day at the office. They have bad workouts. They have other bad aspects of, their professional lives. This one had high consequences. Yes. <laughs> and you know, you take, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you would take, you would take it back if you could, but you can't. Yeah. But I, I do think that as we're talking about solutions, which is what we're, what I ultimately want to get to uh, after the series of this podcast, as we talk about solutions, it's important to keep in mind that many of the professional trail runners in this old trail and ultra space are just that they are professionals in that vocation, right? Mm -hmm. Trail running and ultra running is their vocation. It's what they do for a living. It's what they do every spare moment of their day and things like that. And they're going to make mistakes kind of along the way. And yeah. it's important when you're coming up with solutions and rules framework to keep that context in mind mm -hmm. that that you're dealing with people and it's people's professions that you're dealing with. And those people are not infallible at the end of the day. They're going to, they're going to make mistakes from time to time. And mm -hmm. the rules need to be constructed in such a way to accommodate for all of, all of those different levels of humanity. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the solo for right now, but it's yeah. an, important, <laughs> an important part of it. So let, let's, let's jump forward to the trail and ultra running, the trail and ultra running specific part of it, which is, this is what yes. the audience is going to be the most interested in. So you've gone through your card carrying professional member of your triathlon career. <laughs> you've run afoul of the rules. You got a sanction from USADA. You're still allowed to compete in the sport. You had to relinquish those, that specific race result, as well as yes. all of the earnings from that race. Your sponsor stuck with you the whole time. You then get the trail running bug, like a lot of professional athletes, endurance <laughs> athletes should, because it's such a cool sport. Yeah. So take us into that. And then we'll lead into black canyons after that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was always in the back of my mind to switch over to ultra uh, running and trail running in particular, after I was finished with triathlon, again, coming from a running background, I've been a runner pretty much my entire life. I was definitely known as being a runner in triathlon and having kind of all the endurance background and work um, up to that point, I thought, this would be a really great and fun switch um, for me once I'm finished racing professionally as a triathlete. Um, I also liked the idea of it because it, to me, it seemed a bit more triathlon, professional triathlon can be very high stress. Um, and it is, and it's getting more and more high stress. <laughs> We're very type A the, kind of people athletes in the sport perpetuate that the athletes in the sport definitely perpetuate yes. that, you know, it's true. <laughs> yes, I do know. It's true. Yes. It's very type A kind of sport. There's a lot of equipment and gear and things that oh, can go. Yeah. So you have to be very anal about that stuff. So, um, it, to me, just kind of being able to still compete as sort of a, as an endurance athlete, um, get out into nature a little bit more and maybe let's like, let's step it down a few notches from the high stress of triathlon was very appealing to me. 
And so wait, 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 wait. Um, you're telling me you're not racing with baby Yoda on your back on in, in your triathlon <laughs> days. It's not yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> your arrow helmet. Yeah, the arrow. Like, if I could tuck it into the arrow. Yeah, yeah that's actually. Would, yeah, it probably would run afoul of one of the rules, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Probably there'd be some sort of uniform rule or something yeah. and it could p potentially run afoul from. So, yeah. yeah, actually, that is a little part of it was that like <laughs> this is so far outside of triathlon racing <laughs> that this is great. You know, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I was looking to do that switch and I was looking at 2020 being my last um, full season of racing as a professional triathlete. So I was lining up kind of the last few kind of either bucket list races that I wanted to do or. Um, in particular, actually, ones that I was going to do that were closer to where I grew up in Illinois so that some of my family members who really had never been able to even see me race because I was do busy doing races kind of around the world um, hadn't had a chance to actually see me race a triathlon. So I was trying to kind of check off these boxes um, so that they could have that experience so I could have that experience and just basically kind of make 2020 this this last sort of really fun blowout year in triathlon and then go cool, you know, I'll switch on over after that. And um, I did actually, um, despite um, having really no races in North America for 2020, um, I had, um, with my husband, had gone to New Zealand earlier, well, actually, at the end of 2019, and then into 2020, um, I was planning, I had three triathlon races I was going to do there, um, and then we were also doing a relay race, um, it was my first kind of a multi-sport adventure off-road running race um so it was sort of my dabble where i started to dabble into trail running um which was called coast to coast in new zealand and um so i went managed to go we did that we came back um to the states in march um and so i'd gotten three triathlon races in um, got the multi-sport race in and then that's when everything kind of shut down in the states obviously so pff, no races happening on the triathlon front and so I mean kind of seeing that obviously I mean I wasn't quite sure how long the whole thing was going to last but just decided I mean literally I think maybe the within a week of the first races being canceled for triathlon um, decided I'm going to pivot right now. And I did like that very next day, I decided I'm going to do the four by four by 48 Goggins challenge. So I just went off the rails and went, yep, here we go. So I did that and um, had some fun doing that Went, Yeah, this is a totally different challenge. And just decided I was going to pivot. I mean, my, you know, I still had my same coach at the time and they kind of gave me sort of my next sort of, you know, wave of training. I looked at it and literally had zero desire to do it. I had zero desire to go mm -hmm. and on the bike or, you know, swimming pools were already closing. And I just went, you know what? I'm not in for doing this. And I just said, you know what, guys, that's it. I think I'm done. I'm, I'm moving to, to ultra running and trail running. And, you know, they said, oh, are you sure about this? Are you sure? I was like, Yep, I'm I'm so ready, and that was it. I pivoted hard um, after races started shutting down. So from about you know, maybe like end of March or beginning of April, um, just got back into doing some running and started hitting trails um, in Tucson, and it was great. It was a, it was the perfect sort of pivot from that high stress environment. It was a perfect pivot from all the uncertainty that was going on with COVID. And it was the, the greatest thing ever um, for me, I think, just you know, kind of mentally and even physically to kind of get back into just the running scene. Um, and so got into doing, um, lucky to live in Arizona, where we've got Air Viper Running, who has enough of their shit straight and together, they were actually to pull off a number of races, you know, kind of in the, you know, fall, late summer and fall um, in Arizona. So that gave me an opportunity actually to, I mean, and still, cause I still have, you know, my sponsors, that I had already signed on for that year. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, that was actually part of it too. I was trying to find some sort of outlet to provide them as much exposure as I could um, during this time where we didn't have any triathlon races. So it was kind of a, you know, double thing that I was getting out of it. Um, mentally, it was great for me. And it was also giving them enough exposure or at least some exposure for that year. So um, jumped into doing my first um, ultra race was the 54K Big Pine Ultra um, up in Flagstaff. So that was, I think they eventually got that one off. They had to reschedule it a couple of times, but it was, I think September was the first one that I did. So uh, did that one. 
And then um, I met a few people. I had a great time at that because it's just so different than any of the triathlon stuff that I'd ever done. Didn't look at pace anymore. Didn't actually my whole race strategy. And that was that, especially being at Flagstaff at altitude was that I don't want to ever feel like I'm going, you know, kind of in that red zone at all. Like I want to be able to talk to people the whole time. I had baby Yoda, baby Yoda came yeah. with me on that first race, yeah. um, made some friends that way. And, um, I thought this is great. This is a great approach to like, I just want to kind of chill and have some fun and run a long time. And so that was a great event, um, that I did and was asked immediately after that, Oh, are you doing this as training for the Havelina hundred K? And I said, you're absolutely nuts. I'm not ready to run hundred K, you know, maybe eventually I'll get to that. Um, and, and, and we'll see. So no, I'm not doing Havelina hundred, what are you nuts? And then, of course, that little, that planted a little seed in my head about, oh, 100K, let's see. Um, yeah, I've got, you know, about six weeks or so to get ready for it if I want to do it. Yep, within a week, I signed up to do heavily 100K. Nice. <laughs> nice. So I'm pretty much in at this Proper. point. because yeah, <laughs> We're going full in. And, you know, this is without ever having run anything over a marathon. I mean, I thought the only thing that um, I thought was at least reasonable was that I thought, okay, 100K. I looked at kind of what some of the women's records were. I'm like, okay, it's all around nine hours or so. That's in my wheelhouse because yeah. all my Ironman yeah. races were nine hours. Yeah. I thought, okay, aerobically, I, I can yeah. probably do this. I go, my legs might have something else to say about that, being on my feet for that long. But um, let's see what we can do for that. And so there came my second ultra race was 100, 100 kilometer at Havelina 100. Um, and so, <laughs> so that was it. I was in from that, from that point forward. Um, that's and then easy, just, that's an easy race to, uh, become, uh, to, to become indoctrinated into the sport of ultra yeah. running. It's so fun. It's just such a fun, yeah. they do a great job, great atmosphere. Shout out to Jamil and Jubilee who do just a, just a really, really great job. It's one of my favorite races to go to every year. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, from there, just kind of, then I'm starting to get into a little bit more looking at some of the other races that are out there as, as options and, you know, like, you know, things like UTMB, some of these sort of like qualifying kind of races started to creep into my mind because people started yeah. asking me oh are you gonna try you to qualify the for landscape yep yep the landscape yeah 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 so um the next thing that crept in was you know the qualification to do western states 100 which i'm thinking oh man you know 100 miles that is like a whole other kind of threshold that i thought that's definitely out of my wheelhouse that's going to take a fair bit more lead up and preparation for so that kind of entered the conscious of all right, what's the process of trying to qualify for that to, to do that race? But was so, it, but to, to look at Western States, what captivated you about it? Like, was it the competition? Mm -hmm. Was it the fact that you had to qualify? Was everybody like putting a bug in your ear that you had to do it? Like what, like why Western States and not some other race to focus on? Yeah. I mean, actually a little bit of, of, of all of those really. I mean, it was, people were kind of asking me if I was, you know, getting ready to do that. And so I look into it a bit more and, and see it is one of the most, you know, kind of iconic and, and epic and biggest races out there um, for sure in North America, if not maybe even worldwide. Um, I'm still very new in this whole realm. Yeah. So I don't know like what level I know it's at a pretty high level because it, there's qualification involved. It's hard to get into, but there's also other races that are, I think are just as hard, like hard rock 100. That one's legit. I mean, I've run portions of that course and I think that's absolutely nuts to do that, but it's kind of out there as sort of one of those things like that's pretty nuts. I wonder if I can do it. So the curiosity aspect of it, um, being a hundred miles, um, is one part of it. Can I do that? Um, you know, the difficulty and the competition that's there, um, obviously are all very, um, intriguing to me to kind of be a part of. And most, all of this is just kind of curiosity based, really. I don't have any, um, thoughts of, you know, kind of dominating the ultra um, trail running world. I'm just kind of here to have some fun and sort of see where um, this can take me and what people I can meet and, and what places I can see. I, I, not too much different than my triathlon, uh, my approach to triathlon racing as well. Again, knowing that I'm not going to get rich doing any of this, so I better enjoy it and have some fun and have some good experiences. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. So at a certain point, you targeted Western States, right? Mm -hmm. You got the bug in your ear, you did some research or whatever. Yeah. There's two ways you can get in Western States. You can wait in line through the lottery process, right? yep. which takes people, you know, anywhere between one and 20 years to yeah. get in. Yeah. <laughs> Long time. It's hard yeah. to get in, right? But the point is you have to wait for the lottery. Yeah. Or you, you can earn a golden ticket through one of the races. Yep. So at this point, do you, are you, take us through like how you're trying to figure out how to get into Western States. Yeah. So I guess I was 
looking more kind of the through the golden ticket um, aspect of it um, to see because yeah I wasn't sure how long I could potentially be on a wait list and I thought well you know I'd, I'd done well enough at some of these other ultra races I mean arguably knowing that it was kind of a different in an off year as far as you know competition might not have been as as you know stiff at some of these races than in others but um, I thought okay I'm close enough um, to some of the women's records that they'd set on some of these courses so that I I must be at least good enough so that was my gauge was okay. what are these other women running at these races and I'd look at you know previous years um, runnings and kind of go okay if I'm in this range then I, I might have a good shot at doing this so I decided I'd go kind of the golden ticket route and um, came across the Black Canyon Ultra, which again, another 100K, um, again, another one of Aravipa's races. I mean, at this point, I'd kind of realized that that's a really, I'd, I'd never heard of Aravipa running um, before I did one of the races. Had no idea. Had no idea if it's like some sort of like bogus, weird company that, you know, has like these really shoddy races. I, I'm so serious. And then when I did, I'm like, wow, these guys really know what they're doing. And we, yeah. I'm sure Jamil appreciates that. Guy. I know. I'm sorry, Jamil. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jamil's been on the show before everybody. Okay. <laughs> so I was impressed with how they put on races. Thought it was, you know, very well put together. So I was really having fun doing those and thought, yeah, I mean, obviously Black Canyon, it's literally just up the road yep. from where I live anyway. So very doable race um, for me to do. And so I kind of targeted that one as that would probably be like the first legit ultra race that I kind of put on the calendar and had a legitimate kind of training um, build up to, to get ready for, because I knew the the competition would be stiffer there. Um, wasn't sure how it was going to be golden ticket wise, because I knew that they did, couldn't have the race last year. So there was other people who had already qualified to do, I wasn't quite sure how all that was going to work. I thought, I'm just going to rock up. I'm going to try to do the best I can at this race. And if I get a golden ticket, great. Um, if I don't, then that's fine too. And so that was sort of my take on um, leading into Black Canyon was give it, get a darn good shot and see where you, see where you shake out when some, maybe some of the, the bigger girls show up, I guess, to play. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. you did Black Canyon. Did Black Canyon. Through the results, right? Yeah. 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 So I got, yeah, I got second there at that, uh, at Black Canyon. So that was, that was pretty good. And that was, that was even, that was fun on a different level for me as well, because again, very new. I don't know, I don't know very many names in the ultra trail running world. I know, if, you know, a few of them, but even with the ladies that had showed up to that, to that race, wasn't quite sure kind of what to expect from that. So I spent a lot of that race, um, kind of sussing out the competition yeah. and going like, okay, who do I think can do what? Um, and just trying to figure out where I fit in all that. And then as well as just kind of trying to stay within myself. So, um, but yeah. You, so you went to that race. This is the important part. You went to that race with the express intent of trying to qualify for Western States. I did. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you, and you did by, and I did by, by per their rules, right? You yes. finished within the top two. Yep. You thought you had earned yourself a golden ticket at that point. Yes. Now comes the second inflection part of the story, which we're going to talk about because Western States has an anti-doping policy. Uh, yes. you, you did not. Well, go ahead. Did you know about the policy beforehand? Yeah. So I did read on their website because obviously I looked through the qualification thing on right. their website um, and did read they'd have a page right there on their website about their um, stance on anti-doping. And as I read it, um, I read it like I did most every other thing that I've read over the years in leading into a race was that by entering the race, um, you subject yourself or you leave yourself, you know, open to drug testing or, um, you know, whatever they would like to do. So that is how I read their website. And now, of course, obviously, when I go back and read it, I go, oh, yeah, well, that wasn't exactly <laughs> what it meant. So, but again, I, and I think when people are going to go, my God, like this, like now she has another thing where it's like, she's so absent-minded. Um, and I think the same thing about myself as well. Um, but I guess probably the only thing I can bring up with that is that I don't re I, I don't have a bias toward trying to find ways to cheat or to game a system. So when I read something that has to do with anti-doping or cheating or rules violation, I read it at, you know, from the standpoint of, yeah, sure. Whatever. If I need to test test, go ahead. That's great. You know, whatever we need to do, um, to keep this clean. And it, the other part of it too, being that I had never once, um, had a race where there was a barrier to entry um, based on uh, any sort of previous um, sanction or anything like that. So 
it just wasn't, it wasn't how I read um, that statement. So yes, can I did I read, read it really quick. Yeah. Can I yes. read it really quick just to give context? Yeah. To yeah. So I'm, I, the, the, if anybody wants to go and read through the entire thing, there's going to be a link in the show notes, but I'm going to read kind of some of the important part, parts of this without taking up too much time. Mm-hmm. So your point, Lisa, the, the, the paragraph in question is the first one. I'm not going to yeah. let you get away with that. That's pretty bad. It's the yeah. very first paragraph. It says the Western States 100 mile endurance run has a zero tolerance policy regarding the use of performance enhancing drugs or PEDs. Any athlete who has been determined to have violated anti-doping rules or policies, whether enforced by world athletics, the, which is what governs track and field, the world anti-doping uh, agency, WADA, the U S anti-doping agency, USADA, or any other national sports federation is ineligible for entry into the Western States 100. And so let me cap encapsulate that paragraph really quick. If you've ever violated any anti-doping rule from any of those agencies, world athletics, which governs, uh, uh, which governs track and field WADA, which governs all of the sports or the, or USADA, mm-hmm. any type of, any type of violation, you cannot receive it, or you are ineligible for entry into the Western States 100. It doesn't matter how big, how small, and you're, you know, in your, in your case, you got a, you know, a pub, what do they call it? Public, public warning, it? public mm-hmm. warning. Thank you very much. Yes. Public warning or you're banned from life. Those are the, yes. let me, and let me, let me be clear. Those are the two extremes. Mm-hmm. Public warning is the bottom end of the kind of rule sanctioning process or the most lenient end. Banned mm-hmm. for life is the most extreme example. Doesn't matter. In mm-hmm. Western states' eyes, you're ineligible for entry into the Western states 100, irrespective of where you fall within that spectrum, within those organizations, WADA, USADA, or, or World, World Athletics, which is kind of weird because there's some like weird loopholes in there that you can Correct. probably kind of conjure up. But anyway, yeah. um, that's the first part of it. So if you were underneath these umbrellas and you've served any sort of, or you've had any sort of penalty or violated anti-doping rules or policies, Mm-hmm. You can't receive entry. The second part of it has to do with their in-competition testing. And the, the gist of that states as follows. WSER, which is the Western States Endurance Run, reserves the right to conduct post-competition testing for any and all performance-enhancing drugs listed on the current WADA prohibited list. Any athlete selected for drug testing who refuses to submit to testing shall be disqualified and subject to a lifetime ban from the Western States Endurance Run. All final determinations regarding anti-doping violations under this policy shall be made by the Western States Endurance Run. For purposes of this document's performance enhancing drugs, in quotes, <clears throat> are those listed on the current WADA prohibited list, which basically means they're, they're using WADA's list, right? They're not Correct. making up their own list. They're using WADA's list. Yep. All runners are encouraged to check the WADA website, the most current list of banned su- for the most current uh, list of banned substances. Drugs prescribed by a physician to treat specific medical conditions are excluded unless it is determined that a prescribed medication is being used for non-medical purposes. See appeals process, which is a process later in the document. I'm not going to read that. Yeah. For more information on the prohibited substances, including whether specific medications are on the WADA prohibited list, check the, the global DRO, which we referenced earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, or see supplement 411, which is another resource uh, for information on dietary supplements, including USADA's risk of high risk dietary supplements, on and on and on. Mm-hmm. So my point with reading those first two paragraphs is twofold. First off is what I just mentioned. It's a, you know, a, a ban irrespective of the type of violation. And I think it, right. that's important for people to understand. Second thing is, is they're doing in competition testing, just like you were subject to, Mm-hmm. But they don't have the they don't have the full army of resources at their disposal like USADA mm-hmm. or WADA does. So what they're what they're basic how they're basically handling TUEs is very similar to how USADA or WADA would handle it and say, listen, you have to provide medical documentation if you happen mm-hmm. to run afoul of these rules. They don't. There's no room for a, a to to apply for a TUE in advance within, within right. the structure, it's all in arrears, very much similar to you. This is why, this is part of the reason why this situation is so ironic, right? Because the rule structure that they have, that they have put forth doesn't allow to get approved for a TUE in advance. It's all done in arrears. Correct. So, yeah. so I wanted to paint that picture first. So mm-hmm. you go to Black Canyon, you're second to Black Canyon, you're eligible for a golden ticket. You say, yippee, you know, I'm going to the chocolate factory. <laughs> and then the hammer comes down. Yes. Yeah. So within, gosh, a day or two, 
um, I got an email from uh, Western States um, and bas basically saying, you know, Lisa, are you, we have, a, I don't know if you're aware, but we have a zero, you know, basically kind of what their website says, there is zero tolerance policy about this. Um, because of your um, sanction in 2017, um, we cannot allow you entry into uh, Western states. Um, and they said, you know, kind of follow up with, you know, if you've got any further questions, give us a call. And that was the, that was basically the gist of the email. Um, and so to which I read and went, oh, you know, yeah, I'll definitely call them. Like, I'll tell them sort of what went on with that, like what kind of, you know, sanction is technically still like the word. Yes, it's still a sanction, even though it was a public warning. Um, but I'll, just, I'll tell them the situation. I will also tell them that that particular inhaler um, that I was using no longer requires a TUE, um, kind of painting, the, you know, giving the whole story of, of this, you know, story or giving the whole story of what happened. So I did that um, basically within an hour or so, called them um, and then managed to talk to them and, you know, told them the whole story. And, um, you know, they, 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 they stuck their ground. Um, and it's, it was, I think in, in a lot of ways, it's sort of a waste of my time to tell them the story because that was it. They just said, well, you know, it's still zero tolerance. We can't get into specific um, cases or, you know, basically the story or lead up or any, there's essentially there's no gray area or any variance in that. So. Um, they're I said the rules, right? I yes. mean, they, they, yep. they, they came out with a set of rules and yep. they're sticking the, the flag in the ground yep. and saying, these are rules. We're going to stick by them. Yep. Which I totally respect. I absolutely respect, you know, a strong stance on, on anti-doping. So there was that, that was torn again between this, like, I totally get where, you know, you kind of, you can't get into, you just don't have the resources or do you really want to get into individual stories where you get into somebody right. who's trying to game the system or lying about this or not. And so I get it. And I think they, to a certain extent, I think kind of understand that as well. They kind of realize that there will be people like me who will get caught in kind of this wide sort of net that they've cast out or web that they've cast and, um, and not be able to race their race. And so they kind of, they stuck their ground on it, you know, got to give them, I guess, kudos for that. Um, and, you know, they just said, you know, you know, best of luck and we got to roll your slot down. So that um was that hammer that fell and the first uh, my first reaction to that was because they did tell me that um they had obviously talked to jamil and to jubilee because they needed to tell them it was their race they needed to tell them that they needed to roll down to the next available person to take the golden ticket and so my first reaction was oh my god i have just done you know basically three or four of their races i've just gotten to know them this is very similar to kind of like the the sponsorships that i was trying that i was yeah, negotiating yeah. when the other one came down it's like these people don't really know me very well you know i'm coming across from this other sport like they're now they're kind of wondering who the hell is this person and like my god really so my first reaction was i need to talk to jamil which western states had talked to him so he knew that i had had a previous um sanction and I said, I just need to tell him the story because I don't know what he thinks of this whole thing. Like for all he knows, I could be, yeah, absolute, you know, doper and cheater. So called Jamil and told him the whole story of um, my sanction with USADA. And um, he was immediately, you know, he understood kind of where that was on the scale of um, severe severity, I guess, with, with the sanction from USADA being probably the lowest in severity. Um, and then it, I think the kicker that really kind of pushed him over, maybe pushed him over the edge was the fact that, again, that that, that particular inhaler is no longer required, requires a TUE as long as you use it in a therapeutic dose, which USADA themselves said that I was, was using um, even at the time, so. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a weird story. It's like you said, kudos to Western states for mm -hmm. sticking to their guns. And yep. I would expect nothing less. Yep. Of the race director Craig, who I have the utmost uh, uh, respect for, in their entire board, it's a it's yep. a it's a very hard line policy. It is it has its flaws, absolutely one hundred percent. It is a big line in the sand. Um, yep. It's not something that I would have done. It's something that I would have advised against if I were in that position. It's something that I would, I would advise other race directors and other organizations against something like that. But they, that's kind of what they chose to do. I, in, in, in all fairness, um, I gave, I let, I let uh, the Western States board know that I was going to have you as well as a representative of USADA uh, on the podcast. And that part's going to, and that part's going to come later, just as a professional heads up, because I'm a professional, mm -hmm. I'm not going to, you know, yank the rug out from underneath them or anything like that. I said, Hey, mm -hmm. listen, but 
you were invited to participate in this discussion in any way you want to. I left, I left the door open for them. They yeah. can come on podcast later after this comes out, they can come on, they can email me tomorrow and come on. Mm -hmm. They can come on in conjunction with you in conjunction with you, with USADA, they can provide a statement. I left it open to them how they wanted to handle it, but I wanted to give them the professional heads up uh, uh, that I was, that I was going to do this because their policy is going to come under criticism after this whole dialogue is over. That's just natural. There are going to be some mm -hmm. people that are going to say, rah, rah, this policy is awesome. Mm -hmm. It sticks a clear, you know, sticks a very deep, very clear line in the sand. And there are going to be some people that look through a little bit of the nuance. And I'm one of them that say, this is, we need to think about this a little bit, a, a lot more carefully. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I'll, I'm just going to leave it at there. So mm -hmm. I gave them the opportunity, the opportunity that they, that, that the Western States board decided to take me up on was to provide a statement and they wanted me to read it in its entirety. And I'm going to take the opportunity right now to read it. I know I'm reading a lot of stuff from websites on this podcast. <laughs> I don't normally do this, so I promise, I promise that this is the last one, but this is a letter from uh, Craig Thornley, the race director. I'm going to read it in his, in its entirety per his request. And it states, hi, Jason. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to provide a statement before you interview Ms. Roberts and the USADA representative about her finish at the Black Canyon 100K in February at the Golden and, and the Golden Ticket to the Western States Endurance Run. Western States is a zero tolerance policy regarding the use of performance enhancing drugs. Our policy is clear, quote, an athlete who has been determined to have violated anti-doping rules or policies, whether enforced by World Athletics, the World Anti-Doping Agency, uh, U.S. Anti-Doping Agency or any other national sports federation is ineligible for entry into the Western States 100. That's directly from their website, and then they provide a link to their uh, to that uh, particular policy. In 2017, you saw it determined that Miss Roberts violated WADA's anti-doping rules by testing positive for a banned substance without having a therapeutic use exemption or TUE in place as required during doping control during a doping control session at the Challenge Roth in Roth, Germany on July 9th, 2017. Ms. Roberts accepted a public warning from USADA from her from her anti-doping violation. In addition to a public warning, she was disqualified from all competitive results obtained at Challenge Roth, which is that one race. It always, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's not all, yeah. <laughs> um, from all competitive results obtained at Challenge Roth, including forfeiture of any medals, points, and prizes. Accordingly, uh, according to the US, USADA website, her positive test uh, determination was made, quote, after a thorough review of the case, including the examination of medical records provided by the athlete, end quote, and they provide a, a link to uh, the, the press release from USADA. Right. Ms. Roberts' anti-doping violations fall squarely within the language of our policy, which does not allow for any discretion or review of the case. Instead, we rely on USADA, WADA, and other high-level National Sports Federation to review the underlying facts and circumstances and provide the athlete with, a, with appropriate processes and appeals prior to making a final determination. Due to that violation, we are unable to offer Ms. Roberts an entry into the Western States 100. The golden ticket rolled down to the fourth place finisher at the Black Canyon 100K Craig. So that's their statement. Mm -hmm. I'm going to offer, I'm going to turn the floor back over to you, Lisa, because this is your story. I'm going to offer, offer one, one kind of one piece of uh, color commentary for this before I get into the, uh, uh, the color commentary of the outro, and there'll be a lot of commentary on that. When you're relying on USADA and WADA and, quote, other high-level national sports federations to determine what is banned and what is not banned, Mm -hmm. which is what Western States is doing. They're saying, we're going to follow their rules for what are banned substances, but you're not going to follow their rules on the sanctioning side of things. That is inherently problematic yeah. because you're saying, <clears throat> because you're saying, you know better, you're the experts in this area, right. but we know better right. in this other area, which you have the expertise in. That's messed up. I'm sorry, from yeah. a policy perspective, and that's just one. I'm going to get into a lot more on the onset of this, but that's just that's just one of them. And think what you will. I appreciate Western States for for providing this statement and for drawing a line in the sand. But the but a very clear issue in all of this is you're relying on expertise on one side and not relying it on the other side, and that's problematic. So anyway, yeah. that's commentary on that. We're going to turn it back over to you, Lisa, because I don't want to get, I don't want you to get 
more involved than you need or want to with <laughs> criticizing the rule structure that exists yeah. in this new sport that you're just figuring out. That's not yeah. fair to you. Yeah, I yeah. can take that on because I've been in the sport for a long time. <laughs> so so now, now I want to know, like, what's next for you? I mean, you, you've come into the sport kind of like with wide eyes. Oh, my like, God, this is awesome. You got involved with a really great race organization, Air Viper. They absolutely do it right. Yeah. You're right. The sport is super cool. You can wear Yoda on your pack and yeah. all these other things. You meet cool people. But now you've had this like, you know, like shadow from your past kind of like hang over you in what some people will say in an unnecessary way. Yeah. W what's next for you? I mean, for me, it's kind of continuing on doing what I'm doing, uh, getting into as many you know, of the ultra and, and trail races that I can um, get into for variety of reasons for however difficult that race might be or you know the the setting if it's a different place that I can go and do I mean all all those same things I'm going to continue to do um with obviously the exception of western states at this point um and so because I mean to me it's I mean, that's a, another big reason why I wanted to come on and to actually have a discussion and a dialogue about this so if people go and they look at you know my social media profiles and in my posts. I don't have a post about this after, uh, despite the fact that I've known for a while that I'm not racing Western states. Um, a few people that are close to me know, and you know, obviously know the whole story behind it. But I thought that something like this required, not only because of the controversial nature of this topic um, and the importance of this topic, I thought it required some discussion and some dialogue on and for people to actually hear me um, talk about it and tell the story about it. And I don't think that comes across in a social media post. That's one reason. The other reason is because I do like the ultra running community and I would like to be part of it. And this is part of my story. You know, this happened to me and I worked my way through it. And so it's part of my story, whether people like it or not. Um, but it's, but I don't want it to define who I am and what I enjoy to do. And so it's, I'll, I will continue to kind of move forward in, as much as I possibly can in this space, whether it's you know, ultra running and adventure racing and keep having fun and push myself and have it, you know, adventures and explorations as part of it. So that's, that's kind of what's next. I mean, I'll, I'll continue to target um, races that interest me and kind of make me a little curious as to how I'll, how I'll do with them or how I'll handle them. Um, it just won't be Western States. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, kudos to you for sticking your neck out. I mean, you literally have a target on your back with baby Yoda and that you yeah. can't hide in the crowd, right? Yeah. I mean, unless you <laughs> abandon that, uh, unless you abandon that, that piece of memorabilia. Never. They're yeah. Gonna know, they're going to know who you are and they're going to know kind of part of the story. Not only It'll make its way through. I mean, I remember when this happened, I was at I was at Black Canyons and I drew the lines together very, very, very quickly afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I knew that irrespective of statement or no statement from whoever, it would eventually weave its way into the, yeah. you know, into the soul of ultra running and into the rumor mills and yeah. things like that. And that's part of the reason I want to have this podcast and part of the reason you you agreed to it. Yeah. is that there's no it's like history in fact there's no reason in yeah. kind of like hiding from it we might as well go ahead and tell the whole story yeah. um i want listeners to remember that we're we're kind of at a crux right here with this the ultra running competitions are coming back online we got a break from this in 20 in 2020 but ultra running especially competitive ultra running races are going to come back online we're going to have to face this issue of how to handle anti-doping policy within the sport in an absence of an overall governing body. And yeah. those issues are really complex to come down to answers to. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of elbow grease, you know, a few broken eggs. And unfortunately, Lisa, you might be one of those broken eggs. I'm, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times the story is going to be told as these policies start to, uh, as these policies start to unfold, because I would gather over half, easily over half of the people listening to this podcast, I have no idea that a public warning is part of USADA's sanctioning process. No right. idea. They just think that it's going to be a one-year ban, two-year ban, three-year ban, take away the results. They think that those are the levels of sanctioning that exist in this thing that is a public warning isn't even on, is not on half of the listeners' uh, radars, and, I, yeah. and probably half the race director's radars, for that matter. Yeah. So um, I, I, appreciate you, I appreciate you coming on, Lisa. Um, like I said at the onset, it's not easy. 
Yeah. Um, but this is going to do a service to uh, to all the athletes out there. We're also going to have you as part of uh, the. It's either going to be the next podcast or the next segment. This podcast kind of ran a little bit long, so I'm thinking right now. Yeah. It's going to be the next podcast. For those of you that don't realize, I record things and then put them up asynchronously. So sometimes I'll record mm-hmm. one before the other. And, you know, the one that I recorded yesterday will come out six weeks from now. That's just the way this thing works. Yeah. But yeah. we're going to bring on uh, Lisa with a uh, representative uh, from USADA to not only, we're not going to rehash this story because it's already been told, but we're kind of going to go through some of the mechanics of the testing and things like that to once again paint the picture of how can a sport with no governing body start to come up with some sort of uh some sort of framework so you're gonna have to tear the band-aid off again yeah <laughs> yeah you're going through yeah. that <laughs> that's okay and i guess i would probably add that to my list of sort of what's next is that if this can be a catalyst <laughs> to you know facilitating some of that change um i would i would put my hand up um as the first person to kind of help with that so um you know coming over from another sport that has uh, and being one of those athletes in that, you know, sort of testing regime, um, you know, maybe I can provide some additional insight or um, help with that. And I'm more than happy to offer that. Well, here's going to be the challenge. You brought it up. I wasn't planning on bringing this up until uh, a later a later podcast. But since you brought it up, this is really poignant. The solution to this is going to be earned through elbow grease. It's yeah. not going to be earned through hashtag clean sport or signing, you know, a petition or whatever, putting a sticker on the back of my car, things like that. People are actually going to have to come together without pay and work extremely hard and be subject to a lot of criticism and egg throwing in the peanut gallery yes. to try to come up with, with very imperfect solutions. And yes. That's, that's, that's a key point. They are going to yes. be very imperfect. They're always imperfect. They're going to be very imperfect from 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 the get go, just because it's going to be going to be bootstrapped. Yeah, we need more horsepower there. Yep. And anybody who's out there listening that wants to contribute to that the horsepower, freaking get your pen and paper ready and start catalyzing mm-hmm. athletes and brands and reach out to me and reach out to Lisa mm-hmm. and whoever else because it is going to take a collective effort amongst all of the different constituents, athletes, race directors coaches, sponsors, the whole nine yards to try to come up with something because we don't have it as easy as getting a pro card and being subject to the rules that were laid out before us. Yes. Right? It took yeah. a lot of work to get to that. USA Triathlon is yeah. a big organization and WADA is yes. a bigger organization above them. Yep. We don't have that luxury. Charlotte North Running does, does not have that luxury. And yep. I think that that goes forgotten amongst the sport that we can just wave a magic wand and say, Oh, start testing people tomorrow. It's not, not nearly that simple. So your horsepower, uh, uh, sentiment, Lisa is absolutely warranted. And I think everybody would appreciate it. If everybody, if more people came to the table and, and were willing to do that. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've gone through just recently. Um, there's organized what's called the professional triathlete organization. And that was many, many years in the making many failed attempts at it to band at least the professional triathletes together to take a little bit more control over, you know, kind of how some of these races go on the professional side of things. And I, I, I foresee it as a very similar kind of endeavor um, to get this as well. So, but yeah, it just, it took a handful of people, actually a great group of people, um, a lot of time, a lot of sweat and, you know, a lot of um, starts and stops to get that going, but it is possible. So. All right. Well, yeah. there we go. There is hope. And we have a little bit of a b- blueprint. I think there are more blueprints. Uh, Lisa, thank you. You're going to come back on in another, uh, another podcast that we just determined on the fly. It's going to be a yep. separate podcast. That's fine. And uh, for those listeners out there, stay tuned for the outro because I'll have a little bit of color commentary that is way different than my normal outros and you guys won't want to miss it. But thank you again, Lisa, for coming on. You're welcome. All right, folks. There you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Lisa for coming on the podcast today. As we mentioned during the podcast, this is not easy. And I know that she's going to release, receive a lot of shade for just being in the position that she's in, making some of the mistakes that she's made and kind of owned up to. And my point with this podcast was not necessarily to cast judgment on Lisa specifically in her situation specifically, but just explain one of the complexities of anti-doping structure. If you have learned anything from our conversations with Dr. Matt Fedorik and with Paul Demio and with Lisa and with some of the future conversations that I'm about to have with other individuals is that this shit is really complicated. It's really complex. And 
the current system of rules that exist within WADA and USADA that we're trying to use as framework, they're not as simple as most people are led to believe that you piss in a cup, the piss turns hot, and we're gonna ban all these dopers. There's a lot of nuance in between there, and I hope we're starting to illuminate that through this podcast so that we can all think about that and move forward with reasonable solutions. Now, I promised some commentary on the specific policy with Western States 100, and I'm going to get in, into that in a second. First off, I want to make it clear that these are my opinions. The reason I wanted to do this during the outro and not during the podcast itself, despite my best intentions, I tried really hard, is that I wanted it, I wanted everybody, I wanted it to be clear to everybody that these are my opinions and my opinions alone, not Lisa's. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, I like the people at Western States. I think they do a fantastic job with that race. I have nothing but respect for them. They have always tried to be leaders and on the cutting edge of the entire sport. And by and large, they do the sport far more good than harm because of the care that they take in crafting the race experience for the athletes and what people all around the world get to look on the Western States 100 as this gem of an ultra. I have the utmost amount of respect for, for their board. However, I don't agree with this policy at all. So let's, let's separate the people who I like a lot from the policy. And this is nothing personal, but I do think this policy needs to be scrutinized. And more importantly, we need to learn something from this. And so I'm going to take you through what I think my, what, what are my issues with the policy. And also I hope that that serves as a learning lesson for people out there as we're scrutinizing all of these aspects. The first issue with this is the races shouldn't be responsible for creating anti-doping policy out of nothing in the first place. That shouldn't be a race's responsibility. They should be focused on running their race and adopting policy from some other umbrella organization. What happens when races start to come up with their own policies is this fractured rule structure. Western States 100 is going to have this policy. UTMB is going to have this policy. Run Rabbit Run is going to use the WADA band list, but we're going to add these drugs. Ultra Trail Australia is going to use the WADA list, but we're going to subtract these drugs. And that's hard for the athletes to navigate. And more often than not, when that type of fractured rule structure exists, more athletes get caught up in the paper pushing bureaucracy of it than the athletes that we're actually trying to keep or that we're actually trying to keep out of the sport and they're intentionally running afoul of the rules. And that is tragic. I mean, for God's sake, people, when all the Europeans come over to the US and they think the course is open and they can cut the switchbacks. We can't even communicate that. We can look at examples at Pikes Peak and at uh, the Speed Goat 50K where we can't even communicate a very simple rule change from, the, from Europe to the US. Is the course open? Is the course closed? Do you have to follow the course or can you cut the switchbacks? We have a hard time communicating that. Just imagine how complicated it's gonna be if we have dif different anti-doping rules across different races. It blows my mind. So that's the first thing. Although it's admirable that Western states try to come up with this policy and make no doubt about it, it's admirable. I give them a lot of, I admire the fact that they are trying to draw a line in the sand. But I can separate that admiration from the pieces of the policy that actually matter and where there are holes and flaws in it. So although a lot of people out there will say that, well, this is something better than nothing, we really have to scrutinize that particular statement when we're looking at this. Is it really better than nothing? But the first degree of the first reason this is problematic is simply put, the races shouldn't be responsible for it because it results in a fractured rule structure that the athletes are ultimately going to get tripped up in the bureaucracy of, and then the athletes that are trying to cheat, they're gonna probably get away with more than, than they should. The second issue with this policy is that it's inherently problematic when you're adopting framework 
from who is recognized as a worldwide leader and expert in this area. And then you ignore the framework that that worldwide world leader expert has established in other areas. And with this Western States policy, they're taking WADA's banned list. These substances are banned. We're going to adopt the banned list. We're going to adopt who is sanctioned and who is not. But on the punitive side, how long those sanctions should last for, we know better. WADA has the expertise over here with what should be banned and what should not be banned. But we have the expertise on the punitive side. With all due respect to the fine folks over at the Western States 100, you don't have that expertise. You have to rely on the experts. So you might as well rely on them wholeheartedly. And yes, that has flaws. But you have entirely more flaws and greater flaws when you're trying to create expertise out of nothing. So that's the second issue. It's inherently problematic when you're taking framework from what is a worldwide recognized leader in one area and you're making up or disagreeing with that framework in another area when you do not have that expertise. The third area that this uh, particular policy is problematic is really a technical area. And I would refer uh, everybody out there to go and actually read the policy. I promise I'm not gonna read it word for word. Again, I've done that too much during this podcast, but there's a couple technical issues uh, with the policy as it's written. The first of which is that the only way to accommodate for therapeutic use exemptions is retroactively. So an athlete runs the Western States 100, they pee in a cup, something shows up in their urine and they say, oh, this is a medication that I was taking. They go to their doctor, they get all their doctor's notes, Western States 100 convenes, they say, okay, yeah, this is, we can see that you were using this medically beforehand. We're gonna grant you a retroactive TUE. There's a certain degree of irony that we just went through the Lisa Roberts story where she got tripped up in that and failed to apply for a TUE in advance of a race. And that's her error that she admits. But they granted her that TU after, after she filed for it. There's a certain degree of irony in this particular policy and us going over this situation right now. Some actually might say hypocrisy. I'm not going to go that far, but that's going to be a criticism that is leveled after this podcast for sure. But the fact of the matter is, is the only way that you're accommodating for TUEs is after the fact is problematic. And I get it. Western States doesn't have the resources to manage TUEs beforehand at all. But the fact that the only way is after the fact, after all is said and done, presents this huge gaping hole in the system. The second technical area that is just not, which is just was not very well thought out, to be honest with you, is they leave accommodation for if an athlete has something adverse in their urine, the athlete can challenge it. They can go to Western States and say, here's why this was in my urine. I had a contaminated supplement. You know, I got, you know, this thing showed up because of this reason. All of these things that we see all dopers and all the non-dopers say, they're all the same. Within Western States rules, they will convene a, a, a board of, quote, medical experts to determine this. If we've learned anything from the conversations from Dr. Fedoric and from Paul Demio, that is really complicated. And it's almost hilarious to me that the Western States 100, which is a 5013C nonprofit, by the way, can find the medical expertise necessary to adjudicate those situations. That expertise is few and far in between. WADA and USADA have a hard time figuring out that, that expertise. And even when they get all those experts in the room, they still disagree. So if I were an athlete looking at this, I would be really concerned. I would look at that statement and say, who are these medical experts? Do you have the resources to pull together actual medical experts that understand the pharmacology of doping and what is going to trip the rules and what simply shows up in urine because of whatever other reason? That's really freaking hard. And I highly doubt 
that Western states can pull together the medical expertise necessary in a lot of those situations. And we can go through the annals of WADA and USADA ad nauseum and pull example out of example out of example out of there of where even the best medical experts have a hard time finding this. So once again, the fact that we have this piece of we have this piece of adjudication where medical where Western states is trying to pull together medical experts. I just have a hard time believing that you can find that expertise because it's so few and far in between, and I don't think that anybody's thinking about that. That's the second technical flaw. And let me also mention that there needs to be an avenue for athletes after the fact that have an adverse finding to state their case. There absolutely needs, that absolutely needs to be part of any process. But what I'm saying is, is that part is really, really freaking hard. And go back to the conversations that I had with Dr. Fedoric and Paul Demio, and we go through how complicated some of those can be. The last problem, the last problematic area of this policy though, is actually the biggest. And this is the one everyone should start thinking about. Far bigger than the technical pieces and should the races be responsible for the framework and how do you handle TUEs and things like that. This is a philosophical one. And make no doubt about it, this is a maximalist policy. It treats all athletes who have run afoul of any anti-doping rules stemming from any sport at any point in time, no matter how egregious the offense, you forget to file paperwork or you're a part of some doping conspiracy like we have seen play out many, many times before. It treats all those athletes equally and all of those fouls equally. It would be like in any other sport, a holding penalty is the same as a personal foul and we would never do that. This is a maximalist policy. You're banned for life from the Western States 100, irrespective of any infraction from any sport at any point in time. And when you have maximalist policies, you have no room to negotiate. And make no doubt about it, this is just as maximalist as a policy as saying, we just need to let everybody dope to the gills and create a level playing field there. Both of those are equally egregious and both of those are equally maximalist and neither one of them should serve as the basis for creating rule structure, period. We need to be ignoring the very far edges of the bell curve in this particular situation. What we really need are practical, pragmatic, implementable and reasonable solutions to start out with because it's never going to be perfect. And we're trying to create perfection and boil the ocean, proverbially speaking, with this one singular policy by banning everybody for life, regardless of the infraction, regardless of the sport, regardless of the time frame, and drawing this big hard line in the sand. Once again, the big hard line in the sand is admirable. I get it but it's not where we should start. And I don't think it's where we should end either. The maximalist policy trivializes the complexity of anti-doping policy. And don't get me wrong, it is complex. We learned that from the last two podcasts. We're gonna learn that in a few more podcasts. By casting this maximalist blanket over the entire situation, it's almost as if you're ignoring the complexity and, hope, and hoping it's go away. If anything, it's going to get more complex in the future. So why would you start out planting the line in the sand or planting the flagpole in the sand, whatever analogy I was trying to use, at the farthest point possible, knowing that things are gonna get more complex versus more simple? That's my spiel. Once again, I don't like this personally. I don't think it's good for the sport. I do think that we should, I think that we should not be looking at this as framework. We should be looking at this as a learning lesson for what not to do. If we can learn anything, this is a mistake, in my opinion, and a lot of pe other people's opinions, to be honest with you. 
Not everybody is going to have that uh, same uh, same take as I do. I get it. I'm going to have a podcast in a couple weeks with a couple good friends of mine that will probably disagree with me. And that's cool. We can disagree. I want to hear what you guys have to think, what you guys have to say about the whole thing. Y'all can hit me up, Jason Coop with a K on Twitter or on Instagram. Continue to have this conversation because this is not the end of it. If Western States is the only policy that we've got in town and it's this policy and none of the other races and there's no organizations, as I said a million times before, we're going to look back on this situation 10 years from now and we're going to kick ourselves. So let's look at this with a critical eye. Let's learn something from it and let's come together as a community using this as part of the learning lesson for how to move forward. I appreciate everybody listening to this podcast. As always, we'll see you out on the trails.